thank you very much for the invitation and thanks for being here. I'm going to present this paper, which is doing work with uh, Jason Donaldson, who's at WashU, and Nam Yamalenko, uh, she's a professor at Boston College. And the paper is called Deadlock on the Board. Now, uh, before going into the legal definition of deadlock, and uh, into the model uh, more in particular, I'm going to give you an example of deadlock on the board that may have been salient to some of you uh, last summer. And that was deadlock on the board at Uber. Uh, in fact, there was a three-month deadlock over the CEO appointment. Uh, one director, uh, Benchmark Capital, was deadlocking the board. Uh, so let me read you a quote from one of the early shareholders at Uber's. Um, this, uh, the, the shareholder was saying, you know, Benchmark is holding the company hostage and not allowing it to move forward in its critical executive search. He has threatened to block any funding deals until Mr. Kalanick, who was the former CEO, relinquished the board seat. Now, deadlock on uh, the board at Uber was so severe that it led one candidate CEO, uh, her name was Meg Whitman, even declining the job, uh, citing deadlock on the board. And in fact, she said, it was clear to me that the board was still too fractured to make any progress. Okay. Now, deadlock is not something that's happening one-off at Uber, uh, but it's actually quite pervasive. And deadlock is what lawyers, uh, so deadlock at Uber is what lawyers define as a division among directors, which may render the board unable to take effective management action, and even lead directors to vote wholly in disregards of the interests of the corporation. Now, you may not have heard uh, of a deadlock at specific firms, ex ex except in really extreme circumstances like Uber, and the reason is that boards really try to keep things secret. Okay? But in response to service to directors, it really seems pervasive. Um, in fact, uh, after responses to directors, uh, directors say that 67% of the directors say that they experienced unresolved issued, uh, issues uh, uh, that render the board unable to take effective management action. And 30% of the respondents uh, uh, say that basically they encountered boredom disputes uh, um, affecting mm -hmm. firm survival. And uh, also, deadlock is so severe that, in fact, often shareholder agreements contain clauses that try to resolve this deadlock. And uh, many states in the US have deadlock statutes that give court the power uh, to dissolve deadlock corporation. This is, by the way, a power that these uh, courts typically have in other two circumstances, uh, which are fraud and bankruptcy. And uh, the third one is deadlock. So given it's so important, given it's so severe, and it's so pervasive, these are the questions that we want to try to understand in this paper. Uh, can it be avoided? For example, by appointing the right mix of directors? Um, or for example, by requiring director diversity, independence, long tenure? These are really hotly debated issues um, about boards. If it can be avoided, how should directors be appointed? Uh, so for example, should shareholders appoint directors? Should the CEO? Or should other directors appoint directors? Okay. Now, to answer these questions, we are going to build a model. And this is going to be a dynamic model of board decision making. Dynamic in the sense that it's over time. right? The directors are interacting over time. And there's more than one director. right? There's multiple directors. And I'm gonna, this is just a preview of the results that I'm going to tell you. Okay, the first one, I'm going to show you that there is entrenchment. And in particular, there is entrenchment of CEOs, but you can think about it more generally as entrenchment of policies. What do I mean by that? What do I mean by CEO entrenchment? It means that directors knowingly retain a CEO. They all agree is bad. Then I'm going to show you, and this is kind of a, was a very surprising result for us. And I'm going to show you the intuition for it. The second one, I'm going to show you board composition. And I'm going to tell you that actually diversity and long tenure actually exacerbate this deadlock, exacerbate entrenchment. Then I'm going to go to director appointments. And I'm going to tell you that actually in some circumstances, shareholder may choose not to have a diverse board. And finally, I'm going to tell you about CEO power. And I'm going to tell you that sometimes, again, shareholders may optimally cede power to the CEO to appoint. Okay. So let me try to tell you the model in a very simple. So this model is where we're we wrote a model to try to really capture reality. So the idea was, to, again, a dynamic model with multiple directors. Here, 
I'm going to try to explain the model in a simple way. And in fact, I'm going to just show you that I'm going to I just, I'm going to just need three dates, OK? But it can be extend, extended to multiple dates. And I'm going to think about two directors, OK? But again, it can be extended to multiple directors. Uh, but this is the simplest possible way I could explain the model. Now, at date zero, you're going to have a really bad incumbent CEO is in place, OK? Um, and we all know that this is, uh, we agree that this is a bad CEO. At day t greater than zero, that means at either at day one or at day two, an alternative CEO becomes available. The board is going to vote on whether to replace the bad incumbent with this new alternative. And uh, we, so the board votes, uh, and the incumbent is going to stay in place unless there is strict majority, okay? unless uh, people vote for this uh, new alternative. So let me tell you a little bit about these alternative CEOs. Now, these alternative CEOs generate higher value to shareholders. I told you that the incumbent that is right now uh, governing the firm is really bad. So these new alternatives are better for the firm. These alternative CEOs are also going to have two types. This is, these are just two labels, left and right. So you can think about them as a leftist CEO and a rightist CEO. Uh, but these are just two labels to capture what? To capture, the, for example, the leftist CEO, he is an alternative that really has corporate social responsibility as a priority. He really thinks that corporate social responsibility is what is great for the firm, and that's his priority. That's going to be kind of, you can think about him as an example of a leftist CEO. Now you can think about it as there's another CEO, alternative CEO, that is a rightist CEO. This guy is a guy that has divestiture as a priority, for example. Okay, he thinks that what's best for the firm is the vestiture. Now, so these are the alternatives. So remember, the alternative is better, and it's one of these two types. What about directors? Now, directors also may have two types. And in particular, there, are, there is a leftist director that prefers the leftist CEO. What do you mean? What do I mean by that? Well, the leftist director is a guy that, again, thinks that Corporate social responsibility is what's best for the firm, so really wants to hire a CEO that believes in corporate social responsibility. Whereas the rightist director is a director that thinks that what's best for the firm is divestiture and really wants to hire a guy that has divestiture as a priority. So what do these left and right director represent, this leftist and rightist? They represent the fact that directors represent different stakeholders in the firm. You know, they can be the founders, they can be the venture capitalists, they can be the executives, they can be the block holders, they can be employees or even creditors. These are all different guys, diverse stakeholders, and they have different experiences, different expertise, uh, uh, different backgrounds. Okay? So that, that means that what they believe is best, they disagree on what is best for the firm because of all their different backgrounds and different preferences. I'm going to think about two boards here. I'm going to think about a diverse board. And a diverse board is just a board that has one leftist director and one rightist director. Then I'm going to compare that diverse board with an unaligned board. An unaligned board is, has two directors that think alike. They can be both leftists or both rightists. It doesn't matter. But these are two people that think alike. Okay? They could be both liking corporate social responsibility, for example. And the main question that I want to ask here is the following. We know the incumbent CEO is very bad. We, the directors agree that the incumbent CEO is very bad. And the, the directors agree that they prefer any alternative to this incumbent CEO. Do director replace him with the alternative? And the answer really seems intuitively, yes, we should replace him. And in fact, as a benchmark, I'm going to tell you that if we were to play this game only once, one shot, so there was one period only in which we were interacting, the answer would be yes, we would replace the incumbent. With no dynamic interaction among the directors, you never retain the incumbent. And it's very intuitive why. Both directors prefer any alternative to the incumbent, so why are we keeping the incumbent? We just replace him. So no director ever votes against. No director ever blocks this incumbent. Now to the more counterintuitive and surprising result to us, which was instead entrenchment. I'm going to show you that with dynamic interactions, the answer is going to be flipped. 
Okay? And we are actually going to keep this bad incumbent. So let me tell you first the result and then the intuition. A diverse board, so a board that has a leftist and a rightist director, always retains the incumbent CEO at day one. In other words, we retain a CEO that everybody agrees is bad. It, and this, this leads to the incumbent CEO being entrenched. And again, this is the complete opposite to the one-shot benchmark. So let me give you the intuition for this result. So suppose that the date one alternative CEO is the left type, okay? And the board is diverse. So he's a guy that really believes in corporate social responsibility. Now the leftist director really likes this alternative, right? Because the leftist director is a guy that also believes in corporate social responsibility and would like to hire a guy that likes corporate social responsibility. So what happens is that if this alternative CEO gets appointed, this leftist director will make it really hard to replace him in the future. He really wants to stick with this CEO because this guy is a guy that has the same priorities as him. What about the other director, the rightist director? Well, he likes him less. He likes him still better than the incumbent, but he likes him a little bit less than the leftist because the rightist CEO is a guy that really would like divestiture. So what he's worried about, this R guy, he's really worried that he won't be able to appoint his preferred CEO later on if the CEO comes along. So what is he going to do? He's going to block the alternative, even though he prefers the alternative to incumbent. He's going to keep the bad incumbent, so later on he's going to get his way. He wants to keep the bad incumbent, so he's going to get his way in the future. So then what happens here? This leads to complete deadlock, because each director is strategically blocking the, alter the, 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 uh, the blocking alternative of the other director's preferred type. What do I mean by that? The leftist director blocks the R alternatives. The R director blocks the left alternatives. The board is deadlocked at date one. Okay? And the incumbent, this really bad incumbent, is staying in place. So if you want, the fear of future entrenchment is begetting entrenchment. And this really explains CAO entrenchment. We know that only 2% of firms fire their CEOs each year. And this is, leads to one-sixth of the firing rate that would be there without entrenchment. This is according to some, some estimates uh, by Taylor. Okay? And this result of CEO entrenchment is only due to the fact that multiple directors are interacting over time. So we get entrenchment even without CEOs opportunistic behavior. So we don't need to, to generate entrenchment, CEOs doing something shady or opportunistic, nor we need director disutility from firing. These are the two theor usually reasons why in order to get deadlock, so in order to get entrenchment from models, we have to assume one of these two things. We don't need either of those, okay? We just need directors interacting over time. And this is really resonating with practice. In fact, if we go back to the Uber example, um, there was one director really pushing for a weak, easily replaceable CEO. So let me read you the quote. The company hopes to lock in a CEO by early September, the big question is whether the board can get on the same page. Getting a majority of the eight-person group to support a single candidate is looking to be difficult. Remember, there was a three-month deadlock at Uber over the appointment of the CEO. Some have argued that Kalanick would prefer a weak CEO just to increase his chance of making a comeback. Okay? He wants a weak CEO so it's easier for him to come back later, to be appointed later. And Uber was, the board was deadlocked for months. Now, is there evidence of uh, uh, deadlock on diverse boards? Well, diversity in directors, professional backgrounds, expertise, incentives, blockholders, these are all the things that are generating different preferences, have been shown to decrease uh, strategic change, investment, firm value, acquisition. So they've been shown to basically decrease 
changes, okay, so leading to entrenchment of policies. And this is according to this long list of papers. Okay. Let me tell you about a second result, which is about tenure. Do we want directors to have long tenure? Do we want them to have short tenure? So if you suppose a diverse board with long tenure, long tenure is really exacerbating the results. With long tenure, the incumbent is always retained, he's entrenched. With short tenure instead, the incumbent is never retained. The intuition is that with short tenure, you don't care about the future, okay? So you don't vote strategically. Okay? So with short tenure, think about the one-shot benchmark. We never had deadlock in a one-shot benchmark. Right? So it's really about the long tenures. And this is really, there's been recently a really a big push for short tenure. In fact, institutional investors say that tenure is the next boardroom battle. Advocating shorter director tenure. They say long tenure lets directors get chummy with the CEOs. Right? So they become friends and then they get whatever they want causing CEO entrenchment. Well, we are generating a completely new perspective that is giving exactly the same conclusion, but for a completely different reason. Long tenure makes director behave strategically, and that's what's causing CEO entrenchment. Let's now go to appointing directors. Shareholders, let's think about shareholders appointing directors. So if you suppose now an empty seat on the board, with a leftist uh, uh, incumbent director there. Now, shareholders may actually appoint a leftist director instead of a rightist one, right? Shareholders may actually prefer to have an aligned board rather than having a diverse board. Why? Well, diverse boards cause deadlock. They lead to deadlock, right? Whereas it's much easier for policies to go through and for changes to be made, maybe if there are two, two directors that think alike. And that's why you put two leftist directors there, two people with different experiences, different backgrounds, so that you avoid deadlock on the board. So the fourth result is uh, who should appoint directors. Um, so I'm going to read you a quote from Adrian Cadbury. You may know him because of the chocolates, the Cadbury chocolates, but he was one of the biggest uh, corporate governance activists in the UK. This is what he says. He's, you know, you know, he says the classical theory of the board is that shareholders elect the directors. In practice, however, the shareholders of most public companies have little say in the appointment of directors, other than to nod through the nomination presented by the current board. The legitimacy of the board as the appointee of the shareholders is something of a fiction. Now, the question we want to ask, uh, so we know that CEOs often have the power to appoint directors, and we have a long list of papers that show this. The question is, we want to understand whether it's ever optimal for shareholders to give the power to appoint directors to the CEO. Now, according to Adrian Cadbury, he would say no, right? He would say that's never optimal. But we actually show that it's optimal to give the power sometimes to the CEO to appoint exactly to prevent deadlock. Okay, so and I'm not going to focus on it too much here, but giving the power to the, to the CEO is going to prevent deadlock, so there's more change, policy changes. So we have a lot of implicit implications from the paper. Um, let me tell you a couple. So first, I've already told you that deadlock is more likely on diverse boards, and we have already evidence for this from that list of papers. But also what I've shown you that are new stuff that can be actually tested for is that deadlock is much more likely if directors remaining tenures are longer. Okay, the more director, the longer tenure remaining tenure directors have, the more they vote strategically and the worse deadlock is. Also, um, a director is more likely to vote against a CEO if what? The other director especially favors the CEO, right? If the other director really likes the CEO, then the director is more likely to vote against. When, what else? If the other directors have long remaining tenure, and if the director himself has long remaining tenure. So these are all things that you could go to the data to see whether uh, the model is true. So let me just uh, wrap up a little bit by saying the deadlock is serious. So let me conclude a little bit with the back to the Uber example again. So um, Kalanick re reneged on his agreement to let go of his board seat 
and the two others he controlled. So Benchmark Scholar started contacting his board members from a safari in Africa to alert them. Benchmark was suing Kalanick in a Delaware court. So you can see the deadlock here is not only costly because poor Kohler had to interrupt his safari in Africa, but actually because he was suing Kalanick in court. Okay? So let me conclude. So deadlock on the board, I showed you that it causes CO entrenchment. I showed you the deadlock on the board makes diversity costly. So this is one downside of diversity on boards. And that look on the board explains director CEO power to appoint, explains why sometimes we cede power to appoint other directors to the CEO. That's right. So you can think about, so we, I've showed you the CEO because I think it was the easiest example to think about, but you can think about it uh, extending to any decisions the board is making. So for example, capital structure decisions. Should we increase dividends uh, or not? Uh, potential acquisition decisions. So it's, and actually all those diversity papers that I showed you, you really see that diversity leads to policies being much slower to change. So inertia in policies, and this is really consistent with this model. You see inertia in changing. You're keeping policies for way too long without, before changing them. The other thing that really surprised me was the tenure thing. I thought that shorter tenures would imply uh, you know, short-term thinking yeah. rather than yeah, so this is, uh, exactly. So it's more, in, rather than past tenure, this is all about the future tenure. The more future tenure you have, uh, the more you're going to block strategically because you're thinking about the future. Think about a guy that knows he's going to be over next period. Well, he's not going to be voting strategically because he's gone next period. Whereas if I know that I'm here for the next six years, uh, I really want to get my way in the future, and that's why I'm voting strategically today. Okay? And that's why the remaining, all the predictions about the, are about directors remaining 10 years. Yeah. Um, so I, what I would be interested in, so you said that the shorter tenure and uh, less diverse board is practically helpful to avoid their locks. But on the other side, I would be interested in how helpful that kind of board is to all other activities of the firm and practically what is the cost? No, no, absolutely. Um, so I've shown you today in the presentation a very one-sided view, just because it's the view that it's maybe more surprising, right? But in the paper, we actually have, and I, had, I didn't have the time today to present it, some benefits of diversity. So we actually trade off the benefits of diversity versus the cost of diversity, and we say in which circumstances, and this is what we're exactly exploring more, in which circumstances is diversity costly, and in which other circumstances instead are easy beneficial, and it's about really trading these two things off. Uh, so these are, and it's a very important question. Here is just to say, look, be careful, like we've always been talking about how diversity is good, but we see in empirical papers that actually diversity causes law, uh, you know, firm value to go down. And we're trying to just be the first model that explains one potential explanation for that. But I want to say that diversity can be, you know, really good to have people with different backgrounds as well. On, and it, it comes out in the model as well. Yeah. So then looking at the, like, the economic incentives and you, you abstract the humanist aspect of the board, is there a way to educate the board of directors? Um, is there a way to educate them about their structural biases? Or is there a way, as a follow on, are there ideas about creating incentive structures to prevent deadlocks, to create a mix of alignment, but also a mix, like an optimal mix of alignment versus diversity, and just the, the actual social implications of, of your research? So it's very hard, right? So these directors are not directors that 
be, they are acting against the interest of the shareholders. At least they believe that they're acting in the interest of the shareholders. I think when you're going in even a meeting, you know, you have people with different backgrounds. They disagree about what's the best. I mean, we do it in recruiting meetings, right? We're trying to recruit a candidate and we're just disagreeing. It's not that we are all, we have the best interest of the school at heart but we are disagreeing on what is the best candidate for the school in that moment, right? And this is all that is capturing, right? So these guys have come with their baggage and their own experiences. They see everything through their eyes, the lines of their experiences, and they saw that in their previous uh, corporation, what was working to increase firm value was corporate social responsibility, and that's why they're pushing for it. And that because they want to maximize firm value themselves. So it's really hard to think about uh, so these are not guys that are uh, bad for shareholders necessarily. They end up being bad because then they end up voting strategically. Um, and in fact, I want to even say, like we think about boards a lot and we think about, okay, maybe one solution is independent directors. Let's have independent directors on the board. Um, but here I want to say that even the independent directors have biases. It's not that independent directors out of a sudden don't have experiences or expertise. They come with, and with their own biases themselves. So that would not solve uh, the problems in this model.